Good morning, everyone. Wow, a little bit. Like, would you like to not to be shy and come in the middle or forward? Anybody want to move around to wake yourself up? No? Well, I flew in from San Francisco last night, and it was a delay, so I kind of checked in 2 a.m. So my body is not quite normal, but I'm really, really excited to be here. How about you guys? This is the last day of EDU? <laughs> Woo! How was it? <laughs> Very good. Well, this is the first time for me to be part of EDU. I was a keynote speaker at the South by Southwest um, Las Vegas uh, V2B, and I was a featured speaker at the Interactive. So when I heard EDU opportunity, I said, I wonder what is the audience like? The title said Born to Lead, but I was thinking maybe some of you are born to teach, born to make an impact. How many of you feel that way about your current job? Wow, that's incredible, that's incredible. I think it's a privilege some of us has a life where we get up every day knowing that you're gonna make a difference. My name is Ari Horie. I'm a CEO and a founder of a women's startup lab in Silicon Valley. What we do is we gather female entrepreneurs around the world. We provide curriculum and training to make them successful. And why it matters to me and many of the people who are involved in our company, because we want to see more female leaders out there making differences. Today, I would like to share some of my journey, silly, many mistakes, going through the two different cultures, and see if there's something that will resonate with you and see if you can find your leadership within you. I'm from Japan. I wasn't born here. I was born in a small country city called Hiroshima. How many of you have been to Japan? Oh, OK. That's pretty international. How many of you eaten sushi? <laughs> How many of you had sake and got drunk? <laughs> this is a pretty interactive group. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Um, so this is a picture of a city called Kyoto. I was born and raised in Hiroshima, but Japan's well known for Kyoto. Beautiful, beautiful city. Today, not only I share my story, but I also need you to be open. When I say open, it's you to listen from different place as if it's the first time. Believe it or not, our brain has a certain way to register, and when you hear something, we tend to check off, say, I heard that. But maybe there is something new you'll discover about yourself. So if you could be open, like being curious, like, like childlike, yeah. And if you do, there is a little creature will show up in this picture. This is Totoro. Japanese movie, My Neighbor Totoro, this creature only shows up in front of the children or only in front of the people who have that curiosity and open to discover something new. So I hope all of you see this. And if you don't, maybe the door is over there. No, just kidding. <laughs> I was born and raised with uh, my mother, who uh, was born in a family of governor's family. She was raised a very strict family. However, she had to be divorced. And she had a me, a year old baby. So I was raised in family, the single mom, only child in my culture. Around that time, divorce was considered as really bad things in a culture. People saw her as a failure. The family didn't want it to be associated with her. So she didn't have any help from the family. You made a family name disowned and embarrassed. As she take me through this journey of being a single mom in Japan, she wanted me to be strong because she was a privileged daughter. 
and now she had to stand alone. And when I went to elementary school, my mother gave me a pink backpack while everybody else had red backpack, if you're a girl, and a boy had a black backpack. If you could imagine, when you were seven years old, the first things you want to do is fit in. You check in, in if other people like you. I was so timid. I cry all the time because I was just only child, just felt helpless when I was young. And she just was worried. And so she said, you need to be strong. So she forced me to wear this pink backpack to be different. And she taught me to be different. I remember I was seven years old, feeling pretty annoyed. People were picking on me. And I'm not saying you should do this to your children. <laughs> but maybe when you look back your youth, there's a something that you were different about. But you somehow thought that you have to fit in, you have to hide. And some of you, a teacher or parents, and we try to confirm them to be somewhere we consider is the right things to do for them to operate. Yes, rules are important. Yes, we have to have order. I come from the culture of the order and then paying attention to detail to the point that they teach you how to hold a pencil. <laughs> but there is something about this American culture that I'm really appreciative about, is conversation about embracing the differences. Fast forward. When I was 17 years old, I decided to become an exchange student. I didn't speak any English. One time I was taking a test, and this instructor asked me, do you have a sister? And I literally answered, I like sushi. That's how bad my English was. <laughs> After spending a year in the United States, one of the things I was really struggling was finding my voice, because that is not something we grew up with. In our culture, always being taught to suppress your desire, individuality. As a matter of fact, being only child, you tend to have a center around the world, around you, and you often be labeled as selfish one. So when I came to the United States, many of my teacher or friends would say, Ari, what do you want to be? What are you passionate about? What do you like? Who you want to be? And I, I just didn't know how to answer. Literally, I feel like, ah, please stop asking me. <laughs> and I literally said to me, sincerely, irrelevant. It doesn't matter what I want. Because what's important is we as a team, we as a society, we work together. It made sense to me. It made sense to me then. But then, as I went along, so many people around me, this American culture, they had an opinion. And when you didn't have an opinion, they saw something wrong with me. I'm sure there was an opinion inside me, but I wasn't taught to express. I didn't have even thought process to get there. And I, it was so difficult when I was in college, right? All those American universities have you to present. They ask me, Ari, you have to be a leader. <laughs> I have no idea. Like, why do I want to be a leader? What's the point? Leading sounded so bad because you're not honoring other people. This picture gives me a typical male executive that tended to show up in magazine. 
When I flip around in business magazine, I see men standing in front, not smiling. But when you come across woman's picture, they're expected to smile. You want to connect. You don't want to come across a bossy. And so when I came here, I didn't know what to do. There was no such a thing as a leader that I really cared for. My English is not perfect. I don't walk like that. I don't talk like that. I don't look like that. There's a definition we bought in, how to lead. And I was precisely one of those. And I wrote it off in my head. That's not me, and I can never be that. I worked at IBM. And in many executives, it was very impressive. They were articulate. And I just thought that I wasn't smart enough. Then one day, one of my advisors pulled me on the side and said, Ari, there's a lack of confidence here. What's going on? And then I said, well, I don't know what it mean by I don't have a confidence, or do I supposed to have a confidence? <laughs> like, where? Let me see. <laughs> because in Japan, you're supposed to not talk about confidence. It was just very different culture. <laughs> Can you describe your confident looks like? Can you? And anybody? But isn't it kind of presented how you carry yourself, how you talk? So I thought it's all about more skill sets. Then realize, maybe that's not the case. And that's where I want to share with you today. Being yourself. I thought I'll scribble out on his face. <laughs> The passion. You hear a lot about passion conversation these days, correct? I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs. And some of them are American entrepreneurs, some of them from other culture. Even though on the paper they say exactly what they say, I'm a passionate, I want to change the world, this is my greatest idea, when they gather at our office, they act very differently. Some of the Asian female entrepreneurs, they're very polite to say, I'm safe, you can trust me, I can be your leader or partner. Some other entrepreneurs come from, they don't care, they said, I know the answer. Let me do it, let me tell you. And they just present like they own the world. But they're all leader. And so one of the things that I realized all of them had a passion, but passion that drives others, passion that wake them up every day, passion that attract the people. And you see in this picture, that's a precise example of that. Do you think in Gandhi talk like the other leadership model that we kind of bought in? How many of you kind of bought in that leadership role, the earlier one? Or you think how many of younger generation think that's the role model? It could be changed, but I just want to hear what you thought was a leadership. <coughs> this is the motto I would like to share, which all of us has it, the passion. Gandhi made a stand to say, I want to change the world this way. He wasn't talking loud. He wasn't having this pristine presentation skill. But he shared his vision, and the people came to him. Mother Teresa had the same thing. She had a vision, and others were moved, and they came. What is your passion? Now. Some of you have a passion, and you keep it. You keep it. 
And that's called hobby. <laughs> it's great. Some of the passion that makes it big out there, move other people, and that you be the one, the born to be the leader, sort of a leader, is when you actually share. It's really, really important that you do that. I'll give you an example. Often people think that entrepreneurship is something really big things, right? Great idea, business model, figure it out. But the truth is, sometimes we generate it with a stupid little crazy idea, led by stupid crazy people. <laughs> but it was crazy enough or funny enough, people bought that. People share that vision. Do you know about Pet Rock? Some of you young, too young that might not know. <laughs> Who doesn't know Pet Rock? Can I? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I come from a different country. <laughs> Pet Rock is just rock in the box where you can take care of and talk to <laughs> and respond to you. No, it doesn't happen. <laughs> It helps you to have imagination. But he decided to have a pet rock because he wanted the people to be happy. That was, it. That was his vision. I want people to be happy. Happy. Happy little rock. <laughs> what is your vision? What is the passion? It could be that simple. I have a cookie. Cookie that makes people laugh because a cookie has a certain shape or message. I have one of an entrepreneur friend. She decided to do a traveling company for stuffed doll. Do you understand what I just said? Stuffing doll, <laughs> travel agency. So people around the world come to her site and send their stuffy doll, mostly children to her. And what she does is take them, take the stuffy doll, and take them to Kyoto, take them to Hiroshima, take them to whatever, and then Mount Fuji. And she takes the picture. And then send them back to children. Say, your dear stuffy doll have this experience. Let's learn about Mount Fuji. So it sounded really stupid. <laughs> I know. We should enjoy being stupid, because that's the inner child that we need to embrace, right? But she meant it. She wanted to have that connection for children to see the world. Don't wait till when you have money. Don't wait till when you have a time to travel around the world. And some of the children, they got so involved, and the parents were so impressed. Some of the family brought their children to Japan to pick the stuffy doll up. You can see that, right? Just a little idea. Little idea that inspires others, that led it into something bigger because it was something important. We care about children. We want them to see the world. We want them to appreciate the people around the world. So it wasn't about stuffy doll, right? And I know each one of us has that passion. It looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> looks a little maybe, and you sometimes shame to share other people, but inside you know something awesome that other people don't, and you're afraid to share it. This guy, right, he had a passion, and he let it out, shared, and people came, and guess what? He became a millionaire. Millionaire. Did I just couldn't s s pronounce it? Millionaire. <laughs> if I'm working with an entrepreneur, I should be able to say that word. 100 times correctly, <laughs> right? Crazy idea. So when you have an idea, you need to share and then making an impact. When I talk about hobby, you're good at it, you're happy, and then you share, and there has to be value add. When that happens, the business starts. 
Making impact sometime in the business world only measured by money, right? But many of us know that our life is a lot bigger than just the money. So many people, when we take a survey, said, it's not about money. I care about what I do. I want to have a fulfilled life. I want to feel the love when I'm dying to say I had a great life. So why are we not measuring our life the things we do besides money. So precisely, I didn't want to write make money here. I said it make impact. One of the leadership model that it's eating us up is often measured by title and money to get a validation. But if we can have a new model, the leadership or success, it's not only measured by money, which is really important, right? You, you put out the effort. You want to have the money to support your life. But often we say we want to fulfill my, our life making an impact. Then it should be look at how many people do I made happy today or tomorrow? Is there any way we can measure the impact that you make as a teacher? Wouldn't that be great if we have that? When we support a female entrepreneur, they often come in with not only a great idea that I can make money, they always say at the end of the day, they said, I have a purpose. I want to make a difference. So in order for us to have a leadership within, I think we have to find a passion. And don't worry about what other people think, but it's share. And then measure the success by impact. How many of you can say, I have a passion that I'm afraid to share? Am I putting you to sleep? Come on. <laughs> All right. When you have an idea, I said you have to share. But often, you struggle. So let's talk about that action. When I was 10 years old, I was watching this TV show. It was about the documentary of this university in Poland, um, the student who's studying Japanese. It was weird to me that people in Poland is actually studying Japanese, and they were so rigor in this program that they spoke better Japanese than most of the Japanese people, or knew about the history than most of the Japanese people. So as a 10 years old, I was so impressed. And I went into my room and started writing a note. Said, dear student who's learning Japanese, I would like you to be my pen pal. Please write me back. And then my mom came in and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for a pen pal. I think somebody want to be a friend with me. I was so excited. I was so excited. It didn't matter what's going to happen. I was so turned on with the possibility, possibility but I could have friends from a different country. It, nothing mattered to me. I said, I'm just going to write a letter first, see what happened. And so she said, my mother said, well, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to send it. It's like, OK. So what I wrote was, student who's studying Japanese at Warsaw University in Poland. That's what I wrote. That's what I wrote. <laughs> Makes sense as a 10 years old. So about three weeks later, I actually got a letter. Her name is Maggie. To do that, we became friends. She came to Japan, and she stayed at our house for two weeks. We became a friend. And now, over how many years? 30 plus years? She's still my friend. She lives in Japan now, married to Japanese men, and she's a simultaneous translator. Like something that excites you, you took action. I want to give another story about my friend Ted. He's actually a very successful Japanese entrepreneur in Japan. 
Um, when he was 21, he started a tech company, and he succeeded. And very unusual. So I asked him, how did you turn out to be this way? And he told me this story. His grandfather was an entrepreneur. With the economy going down, one day when he was, I think, 12, came home, and just air was deaf in the family. Very quiet. He knew something's up. And the both parents sat down and said, Grandmother, grandfather lost his business. And we have so much debt. We don't know what to do. And it's just silent. And that night, there was a dinner, but grandfather didn't come down from upstairs. And it happened in two days. He was just not coming out. At this point, you know, you would be thinking, my gosh, it's a trauma. He must be really, really upset. And of course, Ted worried about grandfather, too, because he was vibrant, intelligent, social man that he knew. Third day morning, grandfather come down from upstairs. You know, you hear this night. Everybody was just watching how or what he's going to say. And he said, I lost the business, and I have a debt. I have a better idea now. <laughs> he said, I got the better idea. I'm going to start the business today. Let me see what I can do. And the whole family just said, oh my gosh, your grandfather, what, what part you don't understand? You just lost the business. You can't do this. And he goes, why? I have a debt. Only way I go move forward is to start another business and to be successful. And a whole family was just like, oh my gosh, didn't get it, right? But as Ted, being 12 years old, he understood what fa grandfather was saying, right? He had a passion to create and create and create, create and share the passion for the business and ideas. He wasn't held back by the failure. He wasn't paralyzed by the loss he had. And I, I thought that was a great story because we often try to be too smart adult, as an adult, and we know the whole story about the future already. Right? <laughs> How often we cure ourselves, our own inner passion, that actually let you at least discover. But as an adult, we stop discovering, being curious. Our life is changing as faster than ever before. The technology allows us to communicate and connect to people around the world instantly. You can find the most quirkiest people that exist in the world that you didn't know they existed like you. Blog, all the community exists. So this is a time where if you had this inner passion that you were hesitant about sharing and see what it takes you live it in the right moment. As a CEO and a founder of a Women's Startup Lab, we see so many entrepreneurs come through. And my job is to dig deeper, not just the idea, but even deeper that, that connects with their purpose. And making sure we bring an advisor and mentors, even the investor, around them so that their passion is not left with a small idea, but it connects with not only your purpose, but it makes sure that it's big enough, that has a business opportunity, that has interest to grow so the investor can put the money. Now, you choose to not to go through the path of getting investment and grow your company by getting funded from your customer. But I think what's most importantly is finding your inner passion, allowing that to come out, and you want to make an impact through business or making an impact in your community or sharing that with someone that you care. So my closing is just a key message is to be yourself. Whatever that you have, whatever the career you might have, 
but allow your personal passion to connect with others and society so we can all do the bigger things to make an impact. Thank you very much. So I understand there's a Q&A supposed to happen. And I'll be happy to take any questions. And I'll be also excited to hear some of the, your own personal story. If any of my conversation brought some passion out and have a question about how my passion can connect to the business, something that we can quickly go over. Um, can I actually ask you a question? <laughs> I'm curious because it's important for us, the Women's Startup Lab, it's not just having an entrepreneur being wealthy, but how could we unleash their power and a connection? So, you know, I'm also involved with education in that sense. How many of you are actually educating and involved with innovation or entrepreneurship here? Great, great. Is that one of the things that I see from our children, in the past we, we ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And because I'm in the Silicon Valley, there's so many tech CEO, <laughs> every corner. <laughs> they were saying that, hey, stop asking what you want to be when you grow up. They can actually create a business. They have a way of expressing their passion. Stop saying pigeonhole that they have to wait their life until when they become adults. Tell them, what do you want to be now? And what problem do you want to solve in the world? I thought that was interesting. One of the entrepreneurs said, I don't ask what you want to be. I ask him what problem you want to solve. All right, so here is some of the questions that are coming up. Tell us more about what we started about. How did you get started? <laughs> OK. Um, I had my own Edutech startup. Edutech, I was one of you. All right. So I had a. Um, Technology platform allowing the children to come together and they learn the language through play. So that's what I had. And while that journey, I noticed some challenges among the female entrepreneur. When they pitched, the audience didn't really understand what they were working on because it was mostly male, 40 over a VCs here. Or if it's an engineer, it was a 20 um, some male engineers. So when a woman goes up and said, here's my idea, I want to have an idea to help nurse and a doctor connect, I, I just lost my mom. So I knew the precise issue with that um, whole industry. And engineers split off and wanted to work on another idea, like another dating app to rate the bar or rate the girls, and which bar is the hottest place to hang out. And when I saw that, I said, oh my gosh. We want to change the world. We want to fix the problem. And I wanted to have a woman idea to be taken seriously because it was a serious problem. But the demographic of engineer or the investor did not get serious problem the women were facing every day, and they just didn't get attraction. So I thought having a woman startup lab allow us to bring the resources, attention, and anything we can to make them run faster and stronger while they were wearing a heel. So that's our, <laughs> our focus. Uh, what advice do you, uh, do you have for people who know uh, their passion but do not know how to get started? How to get started? The easiest way that I often uh, recommend is get in touch with the people who might like your passion. <laughs> right? So the blogging or go to some site to share your idea or get going on conversation. Many of the folks that I know, uh, they started, it started off with a meetup. How many of you know meetup.com? OK, OK. So meetup, you can just create a group. So it could be uh, parents who has children who's learning three languages, or you know, somebody who's really passionate about antique postcard. It could be most the quirkiest things. But it sometimes is not a quantity, right? It's a quality of people who deeply understand that subject. So I recommend it, blogging it, uh, connect uh, with the community, or you just create your own community. And then from there, you really think about what is the problem that you're solving? What is the value you can create so that you can begin charging people, right? 
it's nothing wrong with charging people, but it's make sure that there's a value to it. And you will only know when you're actually directly interacting with your community or potential customer. Yes. Um, how can I find a passion that I spend on my, with my family? <laughs> I spend all my time at work and with my family. Okay, very good. Um, I'll share with you. I, um, I have a nine and 12 years old boy. And when I had my first one, I had a, a business at home and literally by the end of like five years, I did not have a me time at all. I know it's funny, but I couldn't even find the time to sometimes go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it was so busy with the kids, everything else. Because with all those internet, I want to be the best mom I can be, business person as I can be, and I just run out of time. But then I had to stop because I cared about my mom for five years when she had a cancer, and when she passed away, I was so depleted. And yes, it was very difficult to have that own time when you have everything else. But I also realized when my mother passed away, I realized the cost that, I, that caused me in my life, the pain, the loss. I literally lost myself, right? And I would like to request, not try to make a time, but when you really spend the time, even just a weekend, an hour or two hour, and talk about how much it's hurting you. If you really know how it's hurting you, you will start making time for yourself. Somebody sent me this postcard card that said, if you love yourself enough, you need to set your boundary to have other people to know how to treat you, how to love you, how to bring you the best you can be. And I think if you don't invest in yourself, nothing actually happened. You become a doing machine. You make money, great, you have a great title, and you think you're fulfilled because the things that maybe our parents used to say, have a great job, a great college, you thought you just bought in, you never had a time to stop and really evaluate. So to give you courage to make a shift in your life, I do recommend having that conversation of working too much, or doing too much for children. Maybe it's costing you. So one of the things for me was how I wasn't being the role model that I wanted to be for my children. Their dad worked all the time, his background is Chinese, work harder if 99 0.9% great score, he will say, but next time work harder. That's his culture. He, he was just really admin about trying harder more and more. And I was the same way. And I knew precisely that's not the value this American culture promote. And they value harder work, but it's different, right? There's more into life. They hug, they kiss, they express their appreciation. And in our culture, we don't do that. And when I was working too much and just taking care of everybody else, I realized that's not the life I wanted my children to have. That was a huge cost that I, I saw myself. And so what I did was weekend. I fixed up the five meals, <laughs> literally freeze them up. I declared that every Friday it's going to be eating out night. Um, I just really spend how can I cut back on the things? Being a Japanese mom, making a fresh meal every three meal was a standard. Not just making it, but have to look good and have to be Pokemon or bento box. And <laughs> they get so geeked out. It's too much <laughs> to me, right, for me. Um, so it's, it's just really step back and question everything. And I'm going a little bit further on this question. I want to share this with you. I even start questioning everything. Right? Do I really have to cook? Can I just eat potato and have a vitamin? I mean, I really went from this standard of a Japanese mom to all the way to, can I just live with a supplement so I can just like save X 
amount of hours in my day. And I even try to move to places so that I don't have to waste the time for my uh, driving, right, commute. Um, I even ask, like, do I have to be married? <laughs> like, why? What's important to me is a deeper relationship and trust. That's what matters to me. But at some point, just like, I have to be married, and I can't get divorced. And that became a conversation instead of like, are we, are we connecting? Like, are we in love? Like, I, you know, just the conversation shifted just to trying to stay in the marriage. It was completely different. It's an obligation and burden. Not about, like, I really care about you. Can we have a date? But not going out the date, right? Because I had many dates that he was just looking at the phone. Like, hello, honey. And he's like, oh, I'm so busy. And so it was a date, but then his definition of date was different than my definition, because I was saying a date. I didn't say, you know, I really want to connect with you. That's what I need to say. So, you know, I question everything, even parenting. Do I have to be that mom who never say no? Do I have to be a mom who always has to give her choices, to empower them? Honey, would you like to go to bed eight or eight or five? Um, <laughs> Or I said, sorry, it's 8 o'clock, damn it, it's done, go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you, you, you guys know more about education, you're going to kill me. But the, <laughs> the point was, I had to play a different role for my children. Like, my mom is so proper, right, and I bought in. I, I happened to be born in Japan, so I was like, oh, konnichiwa, domo, arigatou gozaimasu. <laughs> I was so polite, right? And then in America, you have to walk like this. I can do this. Yeah, look at my presentation. Um, so it's just, I had to play out a different role. <laughs> I get to play out. Because being an entrepreneur, you're challenging the gnome, right? The technology come out in a completely different way of living, completely different of thinking. And we as an educator, as a parents, we have to teach the children to actually think. Not just to think based on the framework that we created, but we have to help them to think beyond what's in it. So actually, they're, they're challenging. And then when I say challenging, what's really, really important is having a conversation about what's important to me, right? The passion. What's important to me? Like, it's not about the marriage only. Even divorce, you could love that person and have a very profound relationship. That's what I, my kids want to see, right? to be able to have a relationship, things like that, right? I hope that kind of went around, but hopefully you can challenge yourself, even looking at the kitchen. Do I have to have all those tools to have a fancy, whatever, you know, works for you? But really, making time is about really uh, breaking down all the things that you habitually do in it, but also break down the value that you start, like, you totally believe in. Maybe it's time to upgrade, right? All right, what is your suggestion if passion doesn't provide the same salary <laughs> you're accustomed to? That's a, that's a challenging one. Yeah. Um, when I went to elementary school the other day, and the teacher told me if I could speak about entrepreneurship. And I said, here's what you guys like, right? Let's say some of you like the drawing, and here's the business world out there. And you're going to keep doing it. And at some point, you start selling your drawing, and people start saying, uh, buying it, and then that the emerges with the business world, and that's where entrepreneurship. It's simple first. Then I said, but you have to have at least something to get you have a food and house and bare minimum. So that's where I think the strategy comes in, right? These days, starting a business cost is so low. You have an internet. And so you, while you're having your business or working, you can actually testing out your idea quite easily. And that's many entrepreneurs being taught, and they started off doing from home. Or start working with other entrepreneurs. So you might not be the founder yet, but work with other entrepreneurs. So learn the know-how. And so that's something I recommend, is to keep your salary, but start having a plan, testing out your ideas good and uh, get together with others who share the, the same passion, and then maybe you can create the business from there. Sorry, I had to keep it very high level, but, um, and big to, uh, what do you call, passion seem too big to 
What do you mean? What if your goal or passion seems too big to become real? I think you should always have a big idea. Investors are not interested in small idea. And if you're OK with not being idea, you can just get the business going from customer. Customer doesn't care if you have big idea or small idea. Are you going to provide me value, right? But if it's a big idea, then you have to look at the market opportunity and how you're going to get there. And then you have an investor who can actually give you money to let you grow it. But you have to have a credential. You have to have a uh, projection. And you have to have a team and all that stuff. So the bigger the idea becomes, you need more preparation. But I don't think the big should be the um, passion killer. Break down the small step first. Because you don't want to die on the day saying that, wow, I didn't try it because I was afraid. Right? And so I recommend it start small, break down the small pieces. Think big, start small, and act fast. So that's what I recommend. The inspired guide. Being an educator entrepreneur, I struggle to find flow balance between working my student family and working on my business. Any word of wisdom? Yes, I do. Um, how many of you have the Lego pieces at home that are just laying around? You step on it, you go, damn it, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have one of those. So what I recommend, get the pieces together, and actually um, each one of us, no matter how rich or poor or talented or not talented, we have a 24 hours every day. And what I do with some of the mom is just, I'm sorry, I'm assuming a mom, but um, really just to break down the pieces, I have a 24 hours, I take six hours, uh, eight hours I sleep, right? That would be the blue code. And then the rest, you have to visually really commit to it, right? If you don't make any shift anywhere, it's in your head, you just feel like you're a victim, you can't do anything. But you literally have to take some of the pink, which was, let's say, you're spending that for the family. And then you have to change that to green, which is for your time. How would you do that? A couple of things, right? You can't buy time. So obviously, you have to find the money from somewhere to invest it in yourself to hire other care to offload the work. And I think we actually know how to solve the problem. I think it, behind this question, also, there is the, the guilt. Or I don't know if I can have other people buy into my idea. I don't know if my husband would offer. I feel like money is not enough. right? But when you're an entrepreneur, they're like problem-solving machine. They choose to go into the ocean of a shark, ocean of the problem. right? So if you want to make something happen, you can choose to be anywhere you are. And the same predictive future happen. Or you have to be courageous to at least to change one piece still borrow money from somewhere to darn it anchor yourself to have your own time to at least let you dream, right? And even if the business doesn't come together, the amount of effort that you made to look at yourself, the better person you're going to be, better teacher or parents you're going to be, it's so worth it. Because if we were, I mean, born to lead, what I mean by it is like you were born to do something, not just being told what to do. The real power resides inside you. And if you don't let that out, you're going to be someone. You'll be doing something for somebody else. So I highly recommend just looking at that, that Lego 24 blocks and really be rigor about replacing the colors uh, using the money and the resources. Or do the barter from your mother's friends or um, do a barter with your um, mother-in-law or husband or wife. OK. What's your best advice in giving a quality pitch and which pitch stand out to you the most? Well, here's a, a basic. There's a tons of a pitch advices on the internet. I mean, YouTube, it's a slide share. So um, you can look all of it. But one of the things that makes um, some of the entrepreneurs stand out is story. Story, story, story story that let them see your passion behind from the investor. Some of the entrepreneurs are very much binary, so they really focus on number. And look, we have this number, this number, this number, 
And Sam just said, it worked before, Ari, because they were so impressive. And, and I want to stick with this format. And I said, honey, you can do that, no problem. But let me tell you, in Silicon Valley, probably the best of the best comes around the world. And you think you're the only person thinking this idea? No, probably 10, 20 people working on it right now. You just don't know them, right? So if you focus on the data and somebody else come out and have a better data, that's it, you're not special. Goodbye, see you later, come back with another data. But what happened is when you tell the story and tell the story about a passion, and a passion means actually representing a strength and commitment about you with this business. Right? Passion drives you to still hang on to that, the wall and say, I'm not giving up. That's what investors and many others are looking at it. And so you know, really um, making sure that your pitch has a story about you, why this particular business matters to you. Just like that stuffy doll uh, traveling agency, if she had a pitch about the travel agency, it wouldn't make a difference, but she had a passion behind. I want to make sure that I inspire children who love the culture and have a huge respect for humanity around the world. That's powerful, right? So um, I recommend you doing that. What are some examples of successful women-led startup you've worked with? Yeah, so successful, I have a different definition of success. <laughs> so, if you talk about billion dollar, there's a tons on the internet, right? Um, but I do question how many of them are fulfilled and happy. I'm often, uh, our program is very much founder center program. We don't decide what startup success should be, like IPO or making a billion. We definitely want them to pursue if that's what they want to do, but there's a consequences, right? You take the money from the investor, they become your boss. And, and they help you to get your company big, but they expect you to work certain hours and certain rigor, a certain limitation and a freedom. And so um, examples of successful women in a startup I worked with, many of them have a pause their, their personal life. They were truly committed in that way. And, um, I usually don't talk about this, but often uh, in the back, they talk about freezing their egg. And I don't know if that's something I would like to promote to younger generation. I'm just saying that that seems to be the option many people ended up choosing. Because if they say, I'm going to have a children, then the investor might not invest in my company. So I hear them talking about it. And they said, freeze the egg as young as you can. Do you have more option? Um, and that you can run the company. I hope that that's not the only choice, and that's why we Women Startup Lab are trying to put the resources so people can run the company without being felt like that was the only choice. So um, I think it's, it depends how your success is being decided. Yeah, I want to redefine what we can have in life. And when you're dying, you're fulfilled. <laughs> yes. Um, could you share some ways educator could empower student to lead? That's awesome. Um, we often, I'll just speak from what I know from Japanese education, because I did not go to elementary school here. I only had a high school two years of experience in the United States. I think we, we teach them teach them, which means it's not necessarily um, about them first. And I think there's a goodness. When I would look at Japanese students or interns come through, they know how to take the order and the run with it. Then they change it, right? So when companies are under the huge pressure, they know how to run as a team. Versus sometimes I get an intern from America, it's very difficult because their feeling come first. So they don't know how to take instruction. Right, and it's just different style. And I think it's a balance is important. Um, empowering them is like explaining what's important here in the sense that they have to learn the structure, but equally, I think it's important to have a conversation about what they are excited about, what is their passion. And having that conversation in the real world, how it could impact, 
like lemonade stand is a great things, right? They just make lemonade stands and uh, somebody buy it because they're thirsty. My 12 years old the other day, he was making uh, Minecraft. It's just square box after square box. And, and he said, Mommy, I made so many of it. Um, I want to sell it. And he was really nervous if anybody would sell it, I mean, buy it. And uh, each of them, he sold it like 50 cents to some of them a $2. Um, so it was very empowering for him that I just kind of pushed out, uh, said, OK, it's not me to answer. It's not you to answer. Let your customer, your uh, friends who likes Minecraft to give you answer. So I think that direct result really empowered them, what they thought that they do have an actual impact in life. You mentioned purpose and passion, which comes first, or does it matter? <laughs> what do you think? How many people think uh, the order matters? No, just kidding. <laughs> purpose and passion. I think passion. Passion, passion is just passion. We can't judge. Passion is just there. I think it begins to accept your passion without any judgment, good or bad, or believable or not believable, stupid or not stupid. Just passion there. And then a purpose is how you want to make a difference from there. And some people has that. Some people don't. And I think it's OK. I had in my life never been clear about the purpose. I just thought, I'm not a big enough person to even having a conversation about purpose. What can I do? Like who I think that I can do something. And when I saw my passion, which was I wanted to make a difference, um, it was, it, I didn't see that as purpose. But when I take it into different contexts, that became a purpose. It wasn't about making a difference only, but I wanted to shape the world differently so that next generation have less things to worry about worry about how they look, what kind of leadership they have to be. I don't want magazines to dictate their images. You know, fashion magazine as well as a business magazine. I'm talking about women particularly, or girls particularly. I want them to never stop and think about why I'm not do getting this. Why are other people saying that you're too aggressive? I want kids to be encouraged to be outspoken, not being judged by aggressive. So I had a passion, and then I put the purpose later. So that's my interpretation. So I think each one of you has you know, own uh, thoughts on this one. What did you tell your eight years old self in one sentence? What would you tell him? I have a nine years old. <laughs> so he gets in trouble quite a bit. He scribbles a lot. He can't stop thinking about it monster in his head. So the math time, he scribbled on the number and a couple of things. So he thinks he's a troublemaker. And I said to him every day, looking at his eye, and said, you need to learn how to run in the race. I don't mean like comp competition. Like, you have to respect the rule. But you know I believe in you. That's all I said. You know I believe in you. And so I don't say you're good. I don't say you have to be smarter. And I just said, I, I want you to know. No matter what it is, I believe in you. And I think it's powerful. Because it doesn't, you don't judge them, but you're leaving up to them. Whatever that is, you're going to choose. You're going to be capable. I believe in you. So sorry, it wasn't one sentence, but that was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> My lab is in Menlo Park. Uh, there's a Stanford University in California. And so our office is like 10 minutes away. And how would you get in? Uh, you do actually apply. And um, you have to have at least the idea that you had a conversation with your customer. Because no matter how many uh, awesome, intelligent advisor we can uh, give to you, your customer is the best person to give you advice. So we need at least uh, any one of you to have that the first product and have some sort of feedback that we can look at it to help you to look at the market, opportunity, things like that. Um, yes? What if you have a mini passion? Which one do you pick? OK, that's really good. You have many of them. 
I think he, my suggestion would be just start talking. Um, I had this like two hour session one time that everybody was asking me about my childhood and everything, and I didn't know what it was, and everybody started saying that your thread, your passion thread is this, but I didn't know. I didn't know. Other people saw it easily. So if you really, really struggle about, like, my, I have a lot of passion idea, there's something actually has a very simple threat. Like, you like to create. You like the art because you want to share the beauty. So you think I have, you know, uh, music, I have uh, art, and, and I like to do this, I like to do that. But what, when you ask other people, sometimes they see the threat. You just want to create something unique, and you want to share the beauty. Or you really want other people to share their possibility. You can help them to express them self through the creativity. Right? So it looked like a lot, but usually the core value, essence of who you are, is actually one or two the most. So I recommend having a conversation with friends and, and family. They might be able to actually point that out. Then that'll help you to actually pick the passion that you like the most. And on, over that, you put kind of business opportunity, which one seems more viable and interesting to pursue, or easy to start also, right? Are we, are we done? OK, good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending time with me. <laughs>